The purpose of this video is to illustrate how we can use the four scales of measurement to collect data to test a hypothesis. What I have here are elements of two experiments that we've already been introduced to. On the left, we have elements of the bubble doll experiment by Albert Bendora, and on the right, we have the video games experiment that was illustrated in the Correlation is Not Causation Part 2 video. The characteristics of each experiment are as follows. The independent variable for the Bobo doll is the model behavior. And for the video game research, it is type of video game. The dependent variable for both research scenarios is level of aggression or aggression demonstrated by the children. So the hypothesis for the Bobo doll experiment is that the model behavior will have an effect on aggression by the children that observe that behavior. And for the video games experiment, the hypothesis is that video, violent video games will have an effect on aggression for children playing that type of video game. Notice that the independent variables in both cases branch off into subcategories or re what we refer to as levels or conditions of the independent variable. For the Bobo doll experiment, the behavior is broken into three categories aggressive, non-aggressive, and the control group. And our job is to determine if the amount of aggression demonstrated by the participants in each of those categories differs. For the video games experiment, the independent variable of the type of video game branches off into two levels or conditions that include a violent video game and a non-violent video game. Again, what we want to determine is if the independent variable has an effect on the dependent variable. And as previously stated, the dependent variable in this example is aggression. But how do we measure aggression? As previously stated, aggression is a hypothetical construct. It is something that we cannot touch. It's intangible. We can't place our fingers on it. So therefore, we have to define it so that we can measure it. And that process is referred to as operationalizing a variable. We're going to use the four scales of measurement to operationalize this variable of aggression. By definition, nominal data includes named categories. But there are named categories that cannot be ranked. So if we want to obtain data, that illustrates the level of aggression demonstrated by the children who are observing the modeled behavior or playing the type of video game, we may simply ask, was the child aggressive? And the only responses are yes or no. So again, this data now is illustrated in nominal format. It's a named category. Another way that we can obtain data at the nominal level is to identify the type of aggression demonstrated. And we could state that there was none, so no aggression, or we could say physical, verbal, or both physical and verbal. So again, the children will be categorized based on the type of aggression demonstrated. So again, here we're defining what aggression is, and then we're able to, to measure it for each individual that it's exposed to these different levels of the independent variable. Now, ordinal data, the characteristics um, of no ordinal include the same characteristics as nominal. They can be named category, but the new characteristic is that it is ranked. So the categories can be ranked. So we could determine the level of aggression for each child and simply say rate the level of aggression demonstrated 
by each child on a scale of one to five. Let's say one is equal to low aggression and five is equal to high. Or we could say um, rate the level of aggression on a scale of low, medium, or high. So again, we see that we have named categories and they can be ranked. These numeric values of 1 and 5 are just labels. Um, they're not the same as um, the numeric values we would use to count something. So again, they're just labels. You can think of them as a synonym for that named category. So again, ordinal data is um, encompasses the same characteristics as nominal, named categories, and the new characteristic is that they're named. So now we have operationalized aggression in these two formats of nominal and ordinal data so that we can collect the data to see if there are difference between the conditions that we are testing. Next, we have interval data. And inter by definition, interval includes the characteristics of the previous um, scales of measurement of nominal and ordinal. And the new characteristic is that the categories are equally spaced out in between one another. Now, for our purposes, um, we should recognize that interval and ratio are often combined into one category. An interval scale of measurement exists for very specific quantitative values that include things such as IQ scores or other standardized test scores such as the SAT, temperature, and values above and below the mean. There aren't a lot of examples of interval data, but it is quantitative, so it's different than nominal and ordinal. Incidentally, nominal and order, ordinal are both qualitative data points, whereas interval and ratio are quantitative. But this interval scale of measurement exists for those quantitative values that don't have a meaningful zero, which is part of the, the definition for a ratio scale of measurement. So I'm going to skip over interval for just a moment and move on to ratio, and I think it'll become evident why I'm doing that in just a moment. So again, by definition, the ratio scale of measurement includes encompasses the characteristics of all previous scales of measurement, but the new characteristic is that it has a meaningful zero. And the meaningful zero enables us to make ratio comparisons, meaning that we can say one child demonstrated twice as much aggression as another. So to obtain this data, we may say um, record the number of aggressive acts demonstrated by each child. And again, the key word is number. So we recognize that this number line that we're counting or we're using to count would begin at zero. So someone could demonstrate zero acts of aggression, one, two, three, four, so on and so forth. But we couldn't have a negative number. Somebody couldn't demonstrate negative two acts of aggression. So that's what we mean by a meaningful zero. It begins at zero and increases in the positive direction. So if we calculate or collect the data for each child, this will also enable us to calculate the mean of each category, each condition that we're testing. And just briefly, the mean is equal to sigma, which means the sum of x over our sample size. So for each condition, we can calculate the mean once we've generated a ratio scale of measurement for each child or the number of aggressive acts demonstrated by each child in each condition. Let's say, for example, participant B demonstrated their x value. Again, x is just a variable. It's a placeholder for number of aggressive acts demonstrated. And their x value is equal to 5. 
And let's just say, and I'm making this value up, that the average for the non-violent video game condition was equal to 7. So we can use this data to now convert it into an interval scale of measurement. So the interval, we may say, identify the number of aggressive acts above or below the mean. So the mean serves as an illustration of the norm. How did the group um, perform collectively? And it's one summary statistic to represent everyone in, in that condition. So in the case of participant B, they um, indicated or we recorded that they demonstrated five acts of aggression. How is that different from the average of seven? Well, we would express it as positive two or two points above the mean. So it's helpful information because it gives us a sense of how that individual differs from, from the norm or the average um, for that particular condition. But it's not as very helpful in terms of comparing the conditions. It's helpful at the individual level but not collectively. So the ratio scale of measurement is actually the most useful um, and because it's quantitative, it enables us to calculate things like the mean and standard deviation, as well as other statistical techniques that we'll learn about throughout the chapter. But in some cases, we may have variables that cannot be expressed numerically. For example, if I were to collect information on your religious affiliation, those are named categories, and they do not encompass a numeric value, so it would be prohibited from converting into a ratio scale of measurement. Now, what I'd like to do is show you how we can consider the four scales of measurement and determine if that group of values is representative of nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio. So if we look at these um, categories, as I just mentioned, as we move our way down, we get more precise, specific information. At the nominal level, notice that when we had posed the question, was the child aggressive or not aggressive? Somebody could fall into the category of yes and only demonstrate one act of aggression. But that category could also encompass individuals that engaged in 5, 10, 15, 20 acts of aggression. So as we move our way down, and let me illustrate that for you. So again, this group may encompass, or an individual is placed into the yes category, but we don't really know how aggressive they were. When we move down to the ordinal level, now that person that was categorized as yes can be better defined by either a value of 1 through 5 or in these categories of low, medium, and high. So we have a better sense of how each individual performed or the level of aggression of each individual per category. So the nominal is kind of vague. It doesn't give us a lot of specific or precise information. As we move our way down to ordinal, then we have more information. We're able to separate those yes individuals out um, more specifically and more accurately. Similarly, when we get to the interval and ratio, specifically with the ratio, we know exactly how aggressive they were. And then the ratio will demonstrate in relation to the mean where those individuals reside. So again, as we move from nominal to ordinal enroll ratio, we're getting more precise, specific information. So one thing that I'd like you to do is recognize that if we take the first letter of each scale of measurement, we can create this acronym, NOR, excuse me, NOR, and that will hopefully help you remember the scales of measurement, nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. Now, the question I'd like to pose is, what do you think this collection of words represents? Is it an example of nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio? To help us answer that question, we can consider interval and ratio. As I indicated before, this is an example of quantitative data, whereas nominal and ordinal are qualitative. 
So quantitative meaning we're working with numbers. These are word categories, so we would conclude that they're not um, an illustration of interval or ratio. Between nominal and ordinal, we would ask ourselves, are these named categories? We've already identified that they are. Are they ranked? And I would argue that they are because, as I just mentioned, as we move from nominal all the way down to ratio, we get more and more specific or precise information. So I would say that the scales of measurement collectively are an illustration of ordinal data. And next, I'd like to illustrate how we can differentiate between discrete and continuous variables. By definition, a discrete variable is a value that can be expressed um, in categories or named values. It could be numeric, um, but primarily we're looking at categorical information. So if we take the nominal example of yes and no, it is not quantitative. So we immediately know that it's a discrete variable. By contrast, a continuous variable it requires that the value be quantitative, numeric, and that it can be broken into smaller portions or it can be expressed as a fraction. So given the fact that the nominal scale of measurement is a word category, it could not be continuous, so it's discrete. Now ordinal data, we have low, medium, high, or low to high represented by these values of 1 to 5. Again, the 1 to 5 is can be seen as quantitative, but it's not um, inclusive of a meaningful zero, and um, we couldn't express those numbers as a fraction or decimal. We wouldn't have, to have a category of 1.5 or 1.25. Therefore, we recognize that, again, this is qualitative data, and so this would also be an example of a discrete variable. For the interval and ratio, again, we're going to identify if it's discrete or continuous. I indicated that interval and ratio are quantitative, so it could be discrete or it could be continuous. To distinguish between the two, we would ask ourselves, can these values be expressed as a proportion, decimal, or fraction? So when we express the distance from the mean in how many points above or below, that would be a whole number. And the reason for that is because aggression couldn't be expressed as a fraction. We couldn't say that a child engaged in 2.25 acts of aggression or negative um, 1.5 acts of aggression below the mean. So because it's a whole number, this is considered discrete. And finally, similarly with the ratio, it's also discrete. Even though it's quantitative, it's a whole number. It cannot be expressed as a fraction or decimal. And I've previously given an example of when um, a quantitative value, such as number of children, is considered discrete. Um, but if we express that value as an average, then it's an example of a continuous variable. Other examples of continuous variables include things such as time, money, height, weight. Money, again, the electronic um, illustration of money can be infinitely um, reported in smaller and smaller portions. So now we have a sense of being able to differentiate between discrete and continuous variables. And that concludes the demonstration of how we can take a hypothetical construct and use the four scales of measurement to measure and define and that variable so that we can test a hypothesis.